Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dawn Marie. In case you haven't met me, I see a lot of faces today that I'm not used to seeing, so I'm sort of excited about that. Um, Dr. Thor isn't here yet, but Dr. Um, Tuba Candy is going to begin um, her speech today. Before we um, get into it, I'm going to do a little housekeeping. You know, we're recording this, so if we can keep kind of noise down to a gentle roar would be good. <laughs> um, she's going to do her presentation. We'll do a little Q&A afterwards, and then we'll take a break. Um, and then hopefully Dr. Thor will be here. <laughs> um, so um, I have to thank you all for making the journey, with especially the Vikings playoff. And I know it's probably, I see a few uh, jerseys in the audience <laughs> here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just happened this way. They don't know you think <laughs> and then also with the snow, I mean, that was kind of a crazy thing, like, thanks, Mother Nature. <laughs> that was awesome. So um, Dr. Tuba Kendi is with the Mayo team. She works specifically, she's a radiologist, and she works with um, doing uh, the Gallium 68 uh, PET scans and now um, heading up also the PRT um, center with the Neuroendocrine Clinic. So I'm going to give it away. Hopefully this is working. Is this working? I think so, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me today. Uh, it's a snowy day. Hopefully uh, we will be able to uh, make it without uh, any problem with the snow. And um, so, uh, we will talk about peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, also known as PRRT for uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, I work at uh, Mayo Clinic for about a year now. Uh, before that, I was at Emory University. And uh, before that, I worked at University of Minnesota. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I'm quite excited uh, that uh, the PRRT uh, is up and coming. Uh, once I, uh, when I started last year uh, at uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, we just had the gallium dotatate starting. And I was very excited, and I jumped over it because it was so exciting. The results were very good compared to Optrioscan. And uh, so we started from over there, and we've been working uh, our way uh, through the PRRT. Uh, and let's start without further. Dr. Kempi? Yes. Would it be possible for you to use maybe the other microphone? Okay. We're having yeah. a little bit of volume. Should I light in the stage Yeah. Okay. That seems to work. Yeah, that's Okay. Here. A little bit excited because we are recorded as well, being on the YouTube and such, you know, never happened before. So uh, I don't have any disclosures to make. Uh, the outline will be, we will talk about uh, what is PRRT, uh, how do we decide which patients will be eligible for PRRT, uh, treatment protocol, the side effects, the outcomes of the PRRT, and I will introduce you our treatment team and our current work uh, for a therapy center. So it's a little bit complicated, right? PRRT, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. So uh, even uh, this kind of a uh, drawing, uh, one of my colleagues uh, worked on last year, it's kind of a, uh, took me a while to understand what's going on. Uh, so the thing is, uh, what we know is majority of the neuroendocrine tumors have high density of somatostatin receptors on their cell surface. That is what we all know. So what we are trying to do a targeted therapy. We want to target these receptors uh, with our medicine, right? So this is our lutetium uh, dotatate. So uh, what it is formed of is a peptide, which is octreotate. Uh, they can go and bind to the receptor. And this is like a, a lock and key system, actually. So. For access to the cell, we need uh, to open this lock. It is like a lock on the cell surface. Uh, so uh, we use the peptide, and uh, we attach our medicine to this peptide, which is radiation, with the help of a linker, which is uh, the dota. And the dota tate comes from the dota of the linker and the tate of the peptide. So we form this lutetium dota tate uh, like a key, and then this can unlock uh, the uh, targeted uh, re receptor on the cell surface so that cell can take this medicine inside. 
So this is the explanation that I found, the lock and key system, is the explanation I found from uh, other resources. And then uh, I was thinking when I was preparing this le lecture, a light bulb came up, you know. I'm like, this looks like a Trojan horse, actually. I don't know if you, the idea is like, like the Trojan horse. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to read about the story of Troys, and you know, maybe you may have watched the Troy uh, movie. So uh, the, the story is like that. Uh, in the ancient uh, years, when the Greeks were fighting with uh, the Troy people, with the Trojans, uh, which are located, which were, uh, they were living on the uh, east, uh, west side of the Anatolia. So they were in a big fight. But the uh, uh, Trojans, the Troy people, had a very uh, strong castle. They were not able to go inside the castle. So what they did, they built up a big, big uh, wooden horse. And they put their best soldiers inside this horse. And then they leave this as a gift to them. And uh, they thought this is a big gift, you know, they, they accepted this inside to the castle. And uh, at the middle of the night, the uh, soldiers came out of the horse and they were able to invade the city by this way. So when I look at each cell, each neuroendocrine tumor cell, which carries this gate, like this is like a castle, right? With the gate. So uh, our Trojan horse is our octreotate, right? So it is the, uh, the receptor uh, that recognizes the octreotate. So, but we hit our radiation uh, to this. So like the uh, soldiers in the Trojan horse. So they go inside all together without cell knowing that. And within the cell, then our radiation dissociates and uh, kills the cell. That is the idea. It works like, I think, uh, Trojan horse. I like this because I come up with it. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope you like that too. Yeah. So and uh, so, what do we need to know before we even think about? Hey, Tor is here. So. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what do we need to uh, know? What uh, before we start? We need to make sure uh, there are enough. Uh, somatostatin receptors on the cell surfaces that we can target. If there are not enough somatostatin receptors, then our treatment, although if we apply it, it wouldn't work. Uh, and uh, that is why we need to do a diagnostic imaging first. Some of you uh, probably already went through that. It is either Octreo scan, uh, the old kid on the block, or the new kid on the block is gallium dotatate. Unfortunately, it is a new kid on the block for us. But it was used for years in Europe and Australia. But it was recently approved. Uh, like last, uh, I think in September or October, it was approved and was made available to us. So with the imaging, we can see if there are enough receptors on the cell surface that we can target. If there are enough, then that means we can treat you. And then we can continue this cycle on and on after each assessment as needed. So uh, this is an example of uh, one of the cases, like, like you see there is like a light bulb here, uh, a tumor site that, uh, that we can identify. Uh, this is the splenic uptake, we look at the liver uptake. If the uptake is higher than uh, liver, and definitely higher than spleen, spleen always light, lights like crazy. Uh, so uh, that means that we can treat you. So this is a decision we make together, come together as a consensus uh, with the medical oncology. So if there are not enough uh, somatostatin receptor uptake, uh, we wouldn't recommend treatment. So you may have uh, looked at your own images, you know, but uh, just to remind you that not every uptake is abnormal. You know, there will be some physiologic uptake that is expected, like in the liver, you see the spleen lights like quite high, uh, and then the bladder, the adrenals, the kidneys, these organs will all pick up. This is normal, you know, this doesn't mean that there is any disease. So, as I told you, I, when I first started, uh, after a month or so, uh, I was approached my, uh, by my division chair and he asked me if I'm interested in looking into organic data studies all together, comparing it them to the older studies and this and that. I was very excited, I was very interested, and he started looking into that. And the more I looked, the more I see how it 
uh, does better than OctreoScan. So it should be the imaging modality of choice. You know, we all know that. Uh, now that it is available, we have no other reason to use OctreoScan. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, OctreoScan takes sometimes two days to do it. You know, you have to do multiple visits, spends hours, and uh, there is also more radiation with OctreoScan. Garden Dota tape is one time visit. It has clearer images. It shows the tumor, like picks up more tumor. Uh, it has a higher detection rate, and it has less radiation. So it has a lot of advantages. Like in this example, this is a 70-year-old male. Uh, you know, he started to have some uh, increase in his uh, some of lab values, and uh, the physicians were concerning about maybe some uh, disease coming up. So they did CT and ocular scan, nothing abnormal uh, was seen. Uh, they weren't able to identify. But when they did the gallium dotatate, PET CT at the same time, uh, they were able to identify multiple spots. These are all uh, small foci of somatostatin receptor uh, rich tumor sites. So especially these two. So they were able to identify that. So gallium dota tape really has uh, a lot of advantages compared to octreo scan. So how do we decide uh, who will be eligible? Uh, of course, uh, we decide this with medical oncology. Medical oncology review the cases, uh, the patients first, and then uh, once they send it, we also review it uh, in our internal uh, system. So uh, the patients who are eligible are uh, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. So histopathology is really important. You should have a histopathologic diagnosis. And uh, in the recent ENETS guidelines, they also suggested there is a group of grade three neuroendocrine tumors which behave better. So they are also called well differentiated. So this group may be considered for therapy as well. So you need to talk about this with your medical oncologist, whether uh, you will be qualified for that. Of course, uh, there, will be, uh, there, there, there is a possibility that there may be a mild impairment in uh, kidney function, which is a uh, very minimal possibility, but uh, there is that possibility with this me uh, uh, medicine. So we need to make sure you have uh, good kidney function. And uh, uh, there may be some effects on the blood, you know, the, your uh, platelets, red blood cells and such. So we need to make sure you have good blood work before we uh, decide to go through with this therapy. And uh, exclusion criteria, because we are giving radiation, we don't do that to any pregnant woman or breastfeeding. It's a big, big no. And uh, then uh, the renal and uh, liver impairment we check to make sure you don't have any uh, problem uh, with the liver or the kidney functions. And then we do check your blood work. We have some levels that uh, we say yes, we can treat you, or no, we cannot treat at that time. But never forget that you may not be qualified this time, but you may qualify along the way. So it doesn't mean that, uh, let's say, just because the blood work you are not qualifying now, uh, that, mean, uh, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't qualify. If your blood work gets better, you may qualify. So. Uh, you, you shouldn't be like, oh, I'm not qualified, so I'm just out. So you shouldn't think like that. And some patients may have some neonatoxic chemotherapy that was done recently, or uh, a radiation that is applied to a larger area of the body. So these are the, the times that we are very cautious about it, and uh, we don't want to do this therapy very close to a, a neonatoxic chemo, some, a chemotherapy that may affect your bone marrow. We don't want to do that. Uh, closer to that therapy. And also the heart failure. Uh, we don't want somebody quite sick with the heart disease as well. So initial consultation, uh, we do review the images uh, and indications and uh, we do review with you the potential side effects. This will be both done by the medical oncology team and also we will do that with you, especially uh, for the potential side effects we will talk with you in, from the nuclear medicine radi uh, radiology side. And uh, you will be also assessed by the medical oncology team, overall your general health, whether you will be suitable to get this therapy. And uh, before this therapy, you should be off of your somatostatin analogs 
if this is long acting one, uh, for about four weeks, and for the short acting one, uh, one day is enough. So you should be off of these medications. So the day of the therapy, uh, we want you to come uh, early in the morning. That is the current situation, but uh, that may change. You know, usually early in the morning, around 8 a.m. ish, uh, you check out to the Methodist. And then we have uh, four rooms in the Eisenberg building. I don't know if you are familiar with Mayo. We have like multiple buildings. Uh, and uh, in the Eisenberg building, we have four rooms that are available for that kind of therapy. And nuclear medicine team will be the first team that you will see. Our nuclear medicine techs, uh, we have a separate therapy techs who are quite experienced with this kind of therapies. They will come and see you, okay? And they will give you a brief review what will happen. And then uh, the uh, radiologist uh, who is in charge uh, that day from the therapist will come and uh, give you a visit as well and will talk about uh, the uh, risks and benefits of this therapy uh, and the side effects as well as we will also talk about the radiation safety precautions that you need to take after the therapy. And then the IV team will come, and they will start your IV line. So I, I've got some uh, photos of our rooms, a couple of them. This is the larger size room uh, in the Eisenberg, seventh floor. It's uh, kind of quite roomy, nice room. And this is a smaller one. Uh, and this is one of the restrooms. So all of them have restrooms inside. After the IV started, the first thing that you will get a nausea medication, both oral and IV you will get, because uh, during this therapy you may feel some GI symptoms, including nausea, uh, maybe some diarrhea, and uh, some stomach discomfort, abdominal uh, pain or cramps may happen. So we will start the nausea medicine. After that, we will start the amino acid solution. The reason we give you amino acid solution is try to protect your kidneys. Because we know that this radiation goes to your kidneys. To reduce the effect of radiation to the kidneys, uh, we give a special amino acid solution to you. Uh, there are different forms of amino acid solutions. Uh, the one that contains all the amino acids uh, found out to cause a lot of GI symptoms. Actually, not the therapy itself, but this a uh, very osmolar, uh, high density amino acid solution is actually <coughs> causing problems. So currently we are using a lysine arginine solution with two amino acids. Uh, so that uh, has significantly uh, less uh, 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 problem uh, with the GI. Uh, you know, it doesn't cause that much of a GI problem. So we do start this amino acid solution and it has to continue for about four hours. While you are getting the amino acid solution, about 30 minutes after that, the lutetium will be started. Our techs will come over. They will be always around, you know. They will be coming and checking out you. And our uh, radio pharmacy is quite involved. Our techs are quite involved. Our radiation safety officer is quite involved, you know, with this. And so they will come and check you. And about 30 minutes after amino acid, uh, you will get the lutetium therapy, which will take about an hour. After that, you will continue completing your amino acid solution about this four-hour period, and then if everything is okay, you will be uh, discharged, uh, and then uh, you will uh, come back for other uh, therapies. So uh, the, the, we usually apply this therapy four cycles uh, every eight weeks. So that is the plan, you know. Um, and uh, there are a variety of ways to do it. It is not something that's written on the stone, but this is the regular way to do it, you know. Uh, this therapy is usually done four times, about eight, eight weeks apart from each other. So then you have to follow up with your clinician because you need to check your, uh, whether your blood is okay, your kidney functions are fine, you know. So you have to come and uh, get your blood work done, do your clinical follow-ups, uh, with your medical oncologist, and uh, also uh, within the first two to seven days after therapy, you should be uh, applied the radiation safety instructions that I will also briefly go through. So this is just a brief review. Uh, the main thing is you have to be uh, 
uh, cautious about the contact with other people because you are getting radiation. So radiation, uh, while it is working inside of your body, it will cause some uh, kind of a radiation to the other people next to you too. It is not like a big, big radiation that you will be uh, exposing people, but you will have some radiation more than what the other people have. Radiation is all around us. We are always radiating now. We are all sitting together. Uh, now we have more radiation, uh, and it's coming from you more to me, you know, <laughs> because there are like, I don't know, 50 people here maybe? So when you think if you are, we had like two people, that would have been quite less amount of radiation. So we keep radiating e e each other in any ways. So, uh, but uh, that, that radiation is a higher than what usually happens. So you have to be a little bit careful with the contact in, uh, with the other people. Uh, especially the first two days uh, are the main thing. For about a week, the contact with pregnant women and children, you have to be uh, cautious. With the hygiene, it is very really important to wash your hands and, you know, uh, uh, flush the toilet twi twice. I always tell my patients that you have to be friends with uh, water for a couple days, you know. You have to wash your hands often, uh, flush the toilet twice, drink good amount of water, you know. Hydrating yourself is important. And uh, because a lot of our patients travel, our radiation safety officer made some calculations. Usually, uh, we don't uh, want you to travel once you are at home for about three days, no, no flights. But uh, after you uh, had the therapy with us, let's say you have to go back to, uh, to your home, then uh, we allow you to fly back to your home unless you are flying more than 20 hours. Uh, you know, if you are flying more than 20 hours, we wouldn't allow, allow but I, I hope everybody is kind of a, a little bit closer. <laughs> so, the side effects, usually they are mild. And it is usually GI symptoms with nausea, vomiting, and a little bit fatigue uh, may happen with some abdominal pain and diarrhea. And as I told you, like, this is likely from the amino acid solution. The current amino acid solution uh, will induce less side effects if it, 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 it causes any side effects. It will be definitely less than the other one. And you may uh, uh, experience exacerbation of some of the symptoms that may happen in 1% of the patients. This is seen uh, mostly with patients with VIP omas, VIP type of tumors, and bronchial carcinoids. So there are certain uh, uh, type of neuroendocrine tumors that may be more prone to have this. So, but uh, that may happen, you know, about in 1% of uh, patients. So the late side effects are uh, there may be some impairment of kidney function, uh, but uh, there is no significant renal toxicity uh, reported. But uh, there may be a little bit decline uh, of the renal function uh, that uh, that uh, will be controlled with your you know blood work and everything, and the other thing is hematological toxicity, which is mostly transient, and uh, you may have drop of uh, some of your blood work, and that will be transient, and then uh, you will recover from that if that happens, and this is also not uh, like. Uh, this happens maybe about 10%, maybe less than 10% of patients, uh, but uh, it is uh, a transient effect. Uh, but you need to follow up with your clinician about this uh, to make sure uh, no other serious side effects happen and they have to follow up you with the blood work uh, to make sure everything is okay. So is it an effective therapy? This is first introduced by Dr. Kweka Boom, which passed away recently. Uh, he, he's a big loss. He was a huge, uh, you know, contributor of PRRT. And he introduced the one with the lutetium in 2003 and published first results in 2005 with one, 131 patients. And according to that, complete response is 2%. So this is not a truly a cure. We know that. But uh, partial response is noted in 26% of the patients and minor response in 19% of patients. Same group also uh, published uh, another uh, article in 2008, which is uh, multiple people referred to, you know, um, it's a very nice article. So this is a larger patient group, including the pancreatic 
uh, neuroendocrine tumors as well. And the complete response was 2%, partial response was 28 and minor response was 16%. Uh, recently, uh, there was another publication with 479 uh, patients, and the disease control reported it is kind of a combination of uh, the, uh, the partial, complete, and minor response all together is about 81%. So uh, the numbers are actually ranges uh, between 10 to 35% uh, with the uh, partial response rate, uh, and uh, that's uh, kind of where we are at. So, uh, if this is an example from uh, Dr. Krenings and Dr. Kvetabov, they, uh, they published uh, together. Uh, so, uh, this is a neuroendocrine tumor patients throughout the four cycles of therapy. If you notice the decrease in uh, intensity and number of the metastatic disease in the liver. So, this is quite nice <coughs> treatment effect. So, I don't know if you heard about NETDAR trial. Uh, this was recently published in uh, April 2017, and this is a uh, you know uh, very important uh, step uh, for the lutetium dotatate because we were expecting to have a phase three trial uh, for some time. Uh, in the I think uh, Thor may uh, like uh, tell that the better than I am, but in uh, radiology like. Uh, the phase one, phase two trial, we are very excited about it, but medical oncologists always like the phase three trials to happen with the two arms, you know, one patient group are getting certain type of therapy and the other patients are either on placebo or another type of therapy so that they can compare. That was that kind of therapy. That was a multi-center therapy with two arms. One arm was the one with the lutetium dotatate and getting a little bit of uh, somatostatin receptor analogs, and the other one, uh, the second arm, got high dose of somatostatin receptor analogs. So they compared these two uh, patient, uh, patient populations, and uh, the uh, response rate in the lutetium group was 18%, whereas in the control group, that's, that was 3%. So uh, overall, lutetium dotatate uh, did much better, and when you consider they were comparing to another effective therapy. So this is one of the patients uh, that uh, we had. We were one of the sites for that therapy in the NETDAR trial. And uh, we treated some of the patients that were within this trial as well. So this was one of these patients who got the therapy and has been stable. You know, this is the pre-therapy in 2013 and still has only stable disease in 2015. So the factors predicting the response. Again, it comes back to the uh, somatostatin receptor imaging. If you have higher uptake in your gallium dota imaging or your octria scan, that means that you will do better with this therapy. And the liver involvement, unfortunately, uh, is not good. You know, the, the uh, limit uh, with the limited liver involvement. The other uh, important thing about PRRC, it really improves the quality of life. Uh, there are a, a few studies done. One of them is again done by this Dutch group, and uh, uh, there are a couple of them too, I noticed, but uh, they are almost on the same range. So it looks like it improves the uh, patient's quality of life about 36%. And specifically, it improves the, some of the symptoms like diarrhea, appetite loss, insomnia in 44 to 77% of the patients. And also they mentioned there is significant improvement in the bone pain as well. So not only with the, uh, the prior uh, things that I mentioned with the net there or the other uh, percentages I told you from the prior studies are all about the imaging changes, you know, whether there is a shrinkage in the tumor, whether, whether there is decrease uh, in the size of the tumor and such. But this is more like uh, the information coming from the patient. You may not look like your disease is not going back, but you may benefit from this therapy still because of the improvement in quality of life. So, uh, as I told you, uh, we have prior experience as a team from NETDAR1 trial. And uh, we recently uh, treated uh, 10 out of 10 expanded access protocol patients uh, 
we have the expanded access protocol, so 10 patients were already assigned. So they got their first line of therapy. Some of them are getting their second line of therapy now. So uh, because they, we have to do this four times. Uh, so we have some experience, uh, and then uh, we, we kind of uh, uh, been uh, working on this for uh, since I started. You know, we are building up our experience. On, uh, as well as we are trying to get ready for this therapy once the FDA approval comes. And uh, let me show you uh, one of our recent patients here. Uh, this patient has been recently treated uh, with us with lutetium dotatate with quite avid metastatic disease, as you can see. And within the last year, we have done more than 300 gallium dotatate PET CTs. And uh, we are anticipating the FDA approval by the end of January, hopefully, because that is uh, uh, the uh, 28th of January is the deadline that they will be releasing the information. So hopefully uh, that will be a positive uh, for us, and hopefully that will uh, include my personal wish. I hope it will include all the patients who are positive in somatostatin receptor imaging. But we will see that uh, how uh, much of this involvement will happen. And what, what are the future directions? Of course, uh, the PRRT can be uh, combined with certain chemotherapies. They do that in Europe and Australia. Uh, along the way, we may start doing that as well. And uh, there is another imaging coming, which is called antagonist imaging. The imaging that we are doing is the agonist imaging. We are uh, marking the active receptors. But there are inactive receptors on the cell surface too. We have no idea about that. So, but with the antagonist imaging, we will see all the receptors. So if uh, we can detect more receptors with antagonist imaging, we can treat more somatostatin receptor positive cells with antagonist therapy in the future. But that may take a, a few more years to come back, uh, to come to us. And there is also a alpha emitters like bismuth which has a shorter, uh, like, uh, like it's a shorter beam and, and a stronger beam, you know. So that, that kind of alpha emitting agents, the, these are like uh, beta emitters, that kind of alpha emitting agents will be uh, in the future, uh, will be also efficient treatment uh, choices. So PRRT is really a teamwork. We have been teaming up with medical oncology uh, from the very beginning. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to work with uh, medical oncology, hematology, GI oncology, endocrinology teams, and the surgery, radiation, uh, radiology, and, uh, and the, in, including international radiology. We all work closely with each other. So uh, as I told you, we did the nuclear medicine team. We formed a therapy center. Uh, therapy center team, like uh, we are trying to build up a therapy center uh, that is dedicated to nuclear medicine therapies. The first aim is to uh, the, to be able to treat the neuroendocrine tumor patients well. So that is our first aim. In the along the way, uh, there will be other therapies coming that will be suitable for other patients, like prostate cancer patients as well. But uh, in our hands now coming is the PRRT for neuroendocrine tumor patients, and we really would like to do it the best way. So uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, we formed this team, and this is a, a team that are formed by physicians, including myself, and nuclear pharmacy, uh, you will see Dennis, Andrew, and Jay, probably if you will have this therapy, you will see these faces quite often, and our uh, nursing staff, our technologists, our finance and administration team, uh, and from the radiation safety officer, uh, Kylie Underwood uh, works on uh, every step of the radiation safety protocol and whether you will be safe to uh, be di discharged from the hospital, so they take care of that side. And we do have the program support to develop this center. So uh, we've been working quite actively and very excited about it, and we really would like to develop a therapy center uh, that is both patient and family centered, uh, and we would like to give the best care possible. And uh, I would like to thank you all. I got 
uh, this from carcinoid uh, uh, foundation, so hopefully they won't be like, why he's using, she's using our zebra, but I loved it. And uh, as uh, they were saying, you know, no two zebra stripes are same, and no two net patients are same. Uh, and, you know, everybody, it, this is like a very heterogeneous uh, disease, so we all know that. That is also one of the reasons why this is diagnosed sometimes later along the way. And uh, yeah, as physicians, we have to be more uh, aware of this, awareness of neuroendocrine tumor, and not accepting it as a rare uh, tumor is the beginning, I think. Uh, so thank you so much, and any questions? So you had a date of, of 128. Yes. Is that, um, refresh our memories, why, why is it 128? That's when the government, the FDA is going to? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, they call it like a FDUFA day, yes. date for that. So that is the time they will, uh, they are supposed to, before that day, they have to answer. Okay. They have to send a response to the uh, company. Okay. So that is, uh, like that may happen before that, yes. or that may happen within the uh, next 14 okay. days. But, but maybe at, uh, on uh, exactly the on same day, you know, we don't know. Sure. But within the next 14 days, we have to keep our ears open. Okay. I'm always on the Twitter and looking, <laughs> checking down tweets uh, to see. <laughs> so trying to see if there will be any approval, really. We are very waiting and hopeful for that. We were expecting that to happen earlier, but it didn't, unfortunately. But with the NETDAR trial, you know, uh, they have now the phase three trial in their hand as well. So a lot of information is available about the safety of this therapy already. And uh, you know, this therapy has been performed in Europe and Australia for more than 10 years now. So, so I think we are ready. Uh, so. How many patients uh, participated in the NETR1 trial at Mayo? I think uh, it is uh, that uh, I, I, I can ask maybe, uh, you may remember because so I, I can't recall how many. Of these yeah, I don't remember either because okay. at that time I wasn't here when the net there one ha one was happening. Uh, but overall, like, like there were like ten or fifteen sites from US, yes. and uh, this was one of the sites. Yes. And I'm assuming uh, if you think about, I think uh, about three hundred patients or such. Maybe uh, if you divide it up, maybe ten, fifteen patients okay. at least should be done here. Okay. My Good. mother was in that first study, oh. and there were eight. 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 Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> so, so is your care center up and running? Yeah. The nuclear medicine? Mm -hmm. No, not yet. They, they, we are thinking about a separate place. But the place that I show you in the Eisenberg building, yes. the seventh floor, it is up and running. So we are up and functioning. But we are planning to make it better. You know, that is our plan. That is our aim. But currently, it is quite well functioning. Our techs are very experienced on giving that kind of medicine, you know, and uh, also the nurse team is very experienced uh, dealing with like the oncology emergencies, like the, the GI symptoms and such, you know, that, that kind of thing. So uh, the, now currently we have four rooms, but what we are thinking, uh, that, may, uh, that we may need more rooms in the future. So we may need to expand uh, a little bit more. Uh, because that therapy may take over and we may need to treat more than four uh, patients at a time. Once uh, you know the approval comes, we will see. And uh, that is why uh, we are working on it. Uh, but currently we are uh, quite well functioning. Everything is uh, very well functioning. Question, oh. is there a chance that the approval will not come? That, uh, I hope not this time, but you you never know, never but I, I don't know, the, uh, there is like the feeling of it will come, I think, right? That is my, like, it's kind of the feel, you know, that it will come, but uh, of course that is not certain still, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it, let's say that thing it doesn't come, we will come up with some researches and things and we will like, you know, uh, it won't be of course, unfortunately, with a real approval, you know, you may not be able to do a large amount of patients, but we will do our best as a team. But, you know, I'm hoping it will be this time. But that is just a feeling. I'm just curious. So with 
the, if it is approved on the 28th, how many patients does the Mayo actually have in queue to get this type of treatment? Then I will drag to Torf, uh, like because they, they see the patients and drag to us. Uh, so I, I don't know, Tor, do you have any? Rachel, what do you think? So I'm not sure. Have you introduced Rachel Irene here to the team? No, I, okay. I, I haven't actually. Hi, Rachel. So Rachel Hi. is Hi. Uh, the uh, PA on the common new neuroendocrine oncology team. So we we don't have a list, we don't have an exact number of patients who are uh, waiting for TRT, but I would say this is it's probably runs in the dozens. That one, then that, 20 to 30? Yeah, at least uh, five or ten boards are urgently needed. Urgently I see, I see. So. Yes? Um, earlier you said that <clears throat> people who responded to PRRT 2% were complete, 28% uh, were partial. Could anybody go back for a second uh, attempt at the four week? Uh, like four times, after four times? Yes. They do that in Europe. Uh, and Australia. This is not something that is written on the stall, you know. They do like shorter intervals. They can go even more aggressive, you know, higher doses. Uh, so in the future we may uh, do that. Uh, we are just now trying to see after approval. That is the, uh, that is the most accepted applied protocol, like eight weeks, four times, uh, 200 millicuries each time, so that is the accepted thing. But it doesn't mean that, oh, we have to do this, we cannot do anything else. Yes, they can, it, uh, depending on how their blood work is, how their kidney function is, what is their status. And uh, as I told you, you know, uh, you may not qualify th this time, you may need to go through another therapy and maybe come back to us. This is like a long <coughs> journey, thank God, you know. So this is like, that is why uh, along the way you, you may get. Maybe let's say you get the four and then maybe you are doing something else and then maybe later on you may get another cycle. So they do that multiple therapies in Europe and Australia quite often and they combine it with chemotherapy as well. Our aim is to, in the uh, near future, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, we kind of adapt and adjust quite efficiently. Our team is incredible about that. Uh, we, we may be doing that. Yes? I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I, not like, I don't know yet, but we are only doing the, expand, uh, the access right now. We have 10 patients already assigned, so we need to finish that up. Uh, let's say if this is not approved, everything go, go down, I'm hoping maybe uh, like medical oncology will come up with another <laughs> trial or something, if that is, uh, that comes to that, you know, I'm hoping, but uh, that, that is not a security. You know, that is, uh, unfortunately, currently we are just talking about how we feel, how we hope this, like this 14 day is uh, like, but you may remember like uh, one and a half year ago, they rejected it. So they put this back, but then the Nectar trial came, you know, it is published. So, I mean, everything is there. So I don't, uh, I, I don't know, like, I'm just very hopeful that this time that will be approved and we wouldn't need to uh, struggle with that. And I'm sorry if you had to go to Europe and Australia to, to get this therapy. I've been reading the, uh, you know, the patient experiences from PRRT web pages from the very beginning. I'm quite involved with it. Although I'm in the, uh, I'm in the under the dark rooms working. I I, I, I feel for that uh, truly, you know. And uh, I hope that will be available here soon so that we can uh, treat the eligible patients here instead of people going to other countries where they cannot talk the, the language and the, uh, everything is different, <laughs> the radiation safety is different, and everything is different. So uh, we are very hopeful. Is there anything that we can do as a group or just politically to help with the FDA approval? Or uh, I think um, at this point, I, uh, I don't think so. I, I Like we are just in very short, <coughs> but if it doesn't get approved, maybe we can talk about it, what can be done, uh, like, because there are a lot of groups, like LA has a very strong group, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, we maybe combining the forces together that the raising the awareness for this is not a rare, uh, uh, like, a disease, and there are that many patients are waiting on the line, you know, uh, to get this therapy, that may be uh, efficient, but I hope it won't come to that. But now we have to wait for the next 14 days. 
for them to approve it. And this may be a question for Dr. Thor, but can you be on Affinitor and, and PRRT? I think so, right, Thor? Yeah, yeah. it shouldn't be a pet. Yeah. yeah. And, and if somebody's had Y90, can they do PRRT? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'll talk about that a little bit. Oh, okay. So that's yeah. a really good question. Okay. You know, I think, uh, Thor, the uh, only thing about Y90, I would imagine if the liver is impaired so badly, like the liver functions are low, then, but Y90 by itself uh, shouldn't cause any problem at all. Okay. If your liver functions are fine, yeah. you should qualify. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> My carcinoid um, flared up and it, it uh, caused me to have two valves replaced in the right side of my heart. Yes. And because of that, I had a carcinoid heart storm disease. syndrome, yeah. whatever, and I lost renal, my renal failure for eight weeks and needed uh, dialysis. I see. And now my kidney function has came back slowly, but I still am not able to have the contrast yet in, in my MRIs and that because of my kidneys. Is this something that in the future, should my kidneys come back strong, that would be something that I could do? I, I think so, the, depending on your kidney function, how it will uh, recover. Uh, because even with some impairment, they do treat patients, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, in Europe and Australia, I've seen in their reports, they do treat patients with, even like, they are not very shy about it. They, they treat patients with certain kidney uh, problems, but of course, we will see the, how the uh, regulations will be uh, like, and then uh, like if your kidney functions come back, as I told you, at that point your blood work may not work, your kidney uh, function may not work, but along the way that may work and then you may qualify. Right, Thor? I hope I'm on the right track. <laughs> <laughs>